the Trevor Sun for Worldwide Markets. Today's topic, very rather portentously named, is uh, Mr. Kuroda's Dilemma. It might as well be Shinzo Abe's Dilemma. And honestly and truthfully, it might as well be named the Dilemma of the Developed World. What we are seeing in Japan. If you look at this chart up here, is emblematic of what's going on around the world in developed countries. And actually, not only developed countries. Let me show you an example here. I'm going to go back and talk to this in a second. Um, but in some developing countries as well. Here we go. This is one. All right, this is um, China. Now, look at the disparity between this. This, of course, is listing total debt to GDP. Can we just put it on for you? Total debt to GDP. Um, and you can see it's 246, around what Japan is. But if we look at this one right here, China's way down on the list. It's number 17, a total debt to GDP. Well, of course, the difference is one is counting total debt and one is counting government debt. To start with, let's look at government debt to GDP. Why it is, why governments have all uniformly taken the same route, and what can be done about it, if anything. Okay, so. Strictly as an examination of Japan, oh, and by the way, of course, everyone who sits in my webinars knows if you have any comments or criticisms or jokes or anything you'd like to add, just put it into chat and I'll uh, acknowledge it and uh, answer it as just as soon as I can, because I do have the chat up here. And also, if you have any comments post, please send them to my email and I will answer them as well. The Bank of Japan, Japan has had a, shall we say, go, a, a GDP problem for more than 20 years now. I do not have up uh, the chart of the Nikkei average, but it peaked almost a generation ago and has not been back there since, almost double what it is today. Uh, I imagine more than a few of you are old enough to remember when Japan was, according to our esteemed financial journalists who never miss anything if it's right in front of their face and generally miss everything else, that Japan was set to take over the world. Japan's economy was the most efficient. It produced goods at lower cost. It invented just in time manufacturing. One small piece of Japan, you know, Tokyo was supposedly worth more than all of China. I mean, all of a certainly all of China at the time, are all of uh, California, or some crazy figure. Um, none of these things turned out to be true, not even remotely true. The Japanese stock market crashed, the Japanese property market crashed, the government forestalled and simply did not do any of the structural reforms that economists, although I have my doubts, um, say might have or could have helped. And the Japanese economy has been woeful by most performance standards for almost two decades. It's not that the Bank of Japan hasn't tried. See, in Japan, as in the United States, as in other countries around the world, partially at the uh, service of their own rhetoric, and partially because governments and politicians are <clears throat> always willing to push off the, almost always willing, to push off the difficult choices onto somebody else, because difficult choices mean difficult reelections. So around the world, we have seen exactly the same movement 
as far as who's responsible for economic policy and who's responsible for making sure that the country continues to grow and prosper. What should be and must necessarily be, and here I do make a judgment, the proper role of government has been devolved partially, as I said, as a result of their own aggrandizing rhetoric. I remember when um, Alan Greenspan, who's still around, and now he's warning against all sorts of things, but I remember when he was saying things along the lines of, well, we have tamed the business cycle. I do not believe that. I do not believe it now, and I don't think it will ever be true. Um, the business cycle is not a function of an economic equation. It's a function of the nature of human psychology when it interacts with an economic system. Right? It's the basis of an economic system. So unless we change, as in the species changes, it's unlikely that the elations and depressions that go with our mortality, shall we say, will desert us either. So the Bank of Japan has done everything, as I said in my brief write-up for this, in the monetary policy hand. Interest rates. Let's take a look at Japan interest rates. Well, first, let's talk about where we're starting, okay? And I'm going to extrapolate from this um, to other countries, but let's just take a look at the overnight call rate. Uh, okay. This is Japan's interest rates. And then we're going to go back to GDP to start over again, okay? These are th this is the, uh, the overnight call rate on a, uh, I think it's on a, a quarterly basis. The white line over the blue. This is 1% right here. So the overnight call rate in Japan, which is equivalent to Fed funds rate, all the other worldwide money market rates, I mean central bank rates, has been below 1%. This looks like 1996. That's 20 years. You think the Fed running rates since 2007? They're a piker compared to what the BOJ has been doing. And what kind of result have we seen? Now remember, 1996, I'm just looking for the, uh, I'm just looking for the, the longest GDP. Here we go, okay. This isn't long enough, let me find a better one. Now, Bloomberg seems Bloomberg's charts are reluctant to give you uh, some items back very far, and I'm not sure why. Uh, come on, where is it? Now let's try this one. Now it's debt to GDP. Sorry, I did put these charts together very quickly. Uh, all right, we're going to have to go with something a little less lengthy than I had hoped for. Okay, this is Japan. Actually, I have the rate on here so you can see. Um, debt, um, the white line is GDP. The orange line is the overnight call rate. And the green line is dollar yen. Nope, let me put it up. Sorry, sorry. Sometimes think that the computers are smarter than they are. Um, so white line is uh, annualized GDP quarterly. Um, the orange is the overnight call rate, and green is dollar yen. So we're keeping in mind that this overnight call rate, remember the scale, where we are now is negative. At no point does this overnight call rate rise above 1%. And the GDP performance bears almost no relation to it. If you look for an average, and I didn't put the average in there simply because it would too many, be too many lines, the average on GDP is probably around 1% or slightly less 
for this 12 year period here. It's the same going back to the advent of essentially zero interest rates in Japan. Whatever the purpose, and I'll argue that there are some other purposes for these very low rates, but whatever the purpose of low rates are, as opposed to what they say they are, what they say they are, of course, is to spur growth. It has not worked. You've heard this from me before, but look at it, any long-term chart. It's like I was listening to a discussion this today on Bloomberg surveillance on the way in about whether or not with the two um, good, as they say, you have to remember something, of course, the two good non-farm payroll reports in the United States, whether the Fed is set to raise rates, whatever. I really have to say whatever to that, which is kind of, you know, a childish and teenage approach. Actually, my kids say, do they? No, they don't say whatever yet. They say no idea. Um, whether or not this is going to happen, whether the Fed's going to raise rates. And two things struck me about the conversation. One, from a monetary policy point of view, from a normalization point of view, whatever that means, for a return to normal pricing for monetary assets. Remember, I mean, what we're talking about when we talk about interest rates, we talk about the price of money. That's who was it, Hubert Herver, Calvin Coolidge said one time about uh, European debts after the First World War to the United States, whether they should be paid back. And, you know, um, his response was, well, they hired the money, didn't they? Meaning, of course, they should pay it back. It's an old term, hired the money, but that's essentially what it is. Interest rates are the cost of money, just like the cost of any other raw material input you use in a manufacturing process. What's required before you open a business? Money. Do most people have, and how do you get jobs? Well, people found businesses, or you expand businesses. And where does that money come from? Very rarely is a business funded from owned capital. It's funded on borrowed money. So if the price for money is essentially zero and the economy is still not growing, then clearly something is wrong in the analysis that says this is the answer. But let's step back from that for a second. So listening to this conversation uh, on Bloomberg surveillance in the morning, by the way, I'm, we're not a Bloomberg uh, we're not, I, I'm not a Bloomberg owner or anything, but I just do feel that it's probably the best business program, as I say very often, um, that I know of in the New York area. So, and Bloomberg, I believe, is worldwide. I mean, I know it is. I'm just I'm pretty sure this program is carried uh, worldwide. So what are we talking about with this enormous discussion? How many times do we have to hear that the Fed is going to raise rates? Well, frankly, from a rational economic point of view, what difference does it make? It's a quarter point. It will be the second quarter point in eight years. We are so far beyond the historical level. But not only that, we seem to be, and this is very difficult to, to ascertain because nobody's ever done this before, below the rate necessary to provide economic, financial, and business guidance. What does that mean? Well, how do you judge whether a business that you want to found or an idea you have is going to be a good idea or just a waste of money? You factor in the costs. You factor in the potential market you think. You factor in the price you're going to charge, and then you put it all together. And then you go over it again, and you question every assumption and then you see if you think it's gonna work. How do you do that on a five-year horizon if you do not have a reasonable idea as to how much that money you're gonna borrow is gonna to cost to pay back when the loan runs out, however long it is? It distorts 
all of the decisions made in an economy. So Japan has been doing everything right according to the demand side Keynesian approach. The problem in the Japanese economy is lack of demand. Well, you pump up demand. How do you do that? You spend money. You lower interest rates so that people in the economy feel more disposed to borrow and spend. And what happens? Nothing. Not quite nothing, but close to nothing. If there ever has been, and I've said this several times before in various, in various uh, applications, the empirical situation to judge the effect of low interest rates and deficit spending at zero bound, it's sitting in front of us here. Let's go back to here. Where's my... Sorry, I didn't label these very well, so... Okay, and then we're going to talk about debt. But essentially, we're talking about the same thing. Okay, here we go. Japanese... Oops, you know, I keep forgetting to put this up, sorry. Okay. Japanese interest rates, 1991 to 2016. Since 1996, they've been below 1%. We have the control situation for trying this item. I mean, the Fed kind of, Ben Bernanke and company, and think that they invented quantitative easing. This is nonsense. It's not nonsense in, this, in the fact that they went out and bought, bought government debt to drive interest rates lower and other debt. But it completely is nonsense in the idea that this was the only way and they were the first one to ever try this. It was nonsense. Look at the Japanese rates. So we have a situation in Japan where both deficit, well, it's with low interest rates and then government spending, Keynesian stimulation, has been tried over and over and over and over and over and over again. I know I've told this story before sitting on trading when I was sitting working for uh, on the trading desk Credit Suisse and I was running the Tokyo markets for uh, the Swiss bank, not Swiss bank, but for Credit Suisse, a Swiss bank. And the Japanese are running their supplemental budgets, which is exactly the same as a week and a half ago, uh, or a week ago, sorry, when the Bank of Japan came in and they disappointed the markets. It's such nonsense. They disappointed the markets. The only thing they should be disappointed in is the results. They don't work. So the Japanese um, would come in and they'd announce another budget or they'd intervene in the yen and it would go one way. And then as soon as the market ended, I mean, Europe started to come in, all the traders, including myself, simply reversed our positions and we made money almost every night. It was ridiculous. You can't manipulate an economy as effectively as central banks pretend that they can. And so this particular item, fiscal stimulation of the economy, the demand side, getting people to buy things is nonsense. It doesn't work at the zero bound and it really doesn't work when the, when the, when the Economic problems are structural. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So Japan has been the poster child for this. So now we have two questions to ask here, or really one question. We have in front of us the record of what has happened in Japan. We have a record of you're looking at right here of low interest rates <clears throat> in Japan since 1990. Let's take another look, a, a wreck, another look. Okay, this is the other side. It's the fiscal side. 
This is Jap Japan government debt to GDP. For the U.S. to get to this rate, we got about, I think, about close to $20 trillion in debt. The numbers mean absolutely nothing. Um, it would be double, the debt would be double, it would be $40 trillion. Their numbers. So we have this side of it. So we have low interest rates for 20 years. We have a more than doubling of debt to GDP in about the same period. Okay, around 100%, it's more than doubling. So we have two of the pillars of this type of monetary policy, a government economic policy, call it, because it's a little bit broader. We have interest rates at zero for 20 years, and we have government spending doubling the national debt in the same period. And what are the results? Well, you would have to say that they're disappointing. Under this kind of nonstop stimulation, you would think, according to theory, Keynesian theory, that you would have a booming economy. Well, you know, of course, the logic there falls apart completely because it's always been true that if all that was needed was uh, inflation and extra money to stimulate economy, then why should there ever be economy that's growing less than four or five percent and everybody's uh, very wealthy and getting wealthier and everybody's very happy because it's nonsense, it doesn't work. Nevertheless, we have proof in front of us. So the question we have to ask next is there something unique about Japan that causes these policies, uh, despite their many, many proponents around the world, um, mainly, unfortunately, in central bank buildings, to fail? Or is there something inherent in the policies that don't work? Or is it necessarily, and most logically, of course, a combination of the two? First of all, let's look and see if Japan is alone in this. Okay, this is debt. I showed this this before. Let's take a look at it again. It's government debt to GDP. You do have to ask yourself, with government debt to GDP this high, remember how the how Greek assets got trashed when they were, uh, look where they are. They're, you know, 70 points below, 80 points below where Japan is. Now, this is total government debt. Um, it, it's hard to get the definitions to agree. I believe that this is government debt. That means all level of government debt. Now, remember, let's take a comparison here. I just show, I'll show you the one earlier. Um, there's another t way to look at this, and that's to look at total economic debt, meaning uh, total debt in the economy. Um, to GDP as well. Let me just make sure everybody can hear um, because the, uh, the headset just took a hit. So let me just make sure uh, the sound is still coming through. I'm assuming it will unless I hear, unless I hear differently from someone else. So this is government debt. Part of the variety in these uh, in a statistic like this, is, is different nations do different different types of funding. One reason why China is so low on this chart, but so high on the other one, is that in China, much of the debt the Chinese haven't got, they don't have the kind of developed financial markets um, to the same degree with the debt that you have in the in the West and in, in Japan. So in China, much of the debt financing for the economy goes through. Uh, state corporations, uh, government controlled banks, things like that. So it doesn't show up as government debt. But China's economic debt is just as high as Japan's and so is ours. If you consider that in the United States, if you consider the overall debt in the debt levels in the economy. Okay. 
Let me just untwist this here. Okay. So. Uh, that's what I just put up. Okay, this is... Central bank assets. That's the stuff that the central banks buy to drive interest rates lower. There isn't even a comparison, this percentages of course, um, there isn't even a comparison between what Japan has been doing and what everybody else has been doing. The Japanese economy is growing slower, and the Japanese are doing more to stimulate it. So where do we have the balance? Let's see if we can look at what, what might be different about Japan first, before we examine the policies themselves. Japan, as we all know, is an island nation. Its interaction, its historical interaction with the rest of Asia has gone from extreme to extreme. For the, what's called the era of exploration, meaning the Western exploration of the world, probably from the uh, 16th century on. Japan closed itself off to the world to preserve its way of essentially life. Um, the samurai system, I guess, feudal system in Japan. Um, I am not a Japanese expert by any means, but the reason I'm covering these things is because I think that they very much matter. That there is a portion of this story and this answer that lies within Japan, that lies within the Japanese culture and within the Japanese view of itself vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. From the early 17th century until uh, Commodore Perry, almost 250 years, the Japanese essentially closed themselves off to the rest of the world. I mean, it's a fascinating story. The Dutch probably got there, I think, in the early 17th century. I'm not sure of the dates on this, the, uh, within, you know, 20 years or so. And firearms were known in Japan. And then the Japanese government outlawed them. They just outlawed them and outlawed all, all foreign interaction. The arms that did exist, the firearms, blunderbusses and things like that, matchlocks that did exist in Japan were rounded up and I think hidden in a castle someplace. And the Japanese con continued with their edge-based weaponry system for almost another 250 years. It's an astonishing story. Only possible on an island. only possible on a pre-technology world in the sense that right now you couldn't possibly do that, right? The internet exists. The only country that I know that manages to do something like that is Bhutan, which I've never been to. Um, anyway, so Japan's self-image I'm trying to be careful because, I, as I said, I've never been to Japan and I've never lived in Japan. Um, so it's, I want to be very careful, if I can, about how I'm characterizing a culture when I'm talking about their interaction with the rest of the world, because that's essentially what we're talking about. You can look at productivity as a way to look at it. Um, productivity is the output per worker times the number of workers. I mean, that's really all it is. So if your number of workers goes down, your productivity goes down. Your GDP goes down, or can go down. We've all heard the story 
uh, I'm sure we know about it, of Japan's population, which is declining. How does this affect an economy? Well, it seems to be that it saps its growth outlook. So in that sense, we are looking at a statistic affecting GDP, affecting, if you will, the effectiveness, the efficacy of these, the economic policies followed by the government that the government doesn't really have any control over in the sense, you know, that they can try and encourage women and families, men and women, to have more children. But that is a long run generational prospect, and it's one that's very difficult to reverse. But all right, so we can we can say that Japan has, and this is one of them, a unique or semi-unique truck structural issue. They have a declining population. And I think one of the ideas that I would hold to is that this affects the performance of the economy in ways that are difficult to codify. They're difficult to put in an economic equation. What factor do you put in and how do you judge it? How do you create it, if you will? Your economic, your GDP calculation, projection into the future for the fact that innovation is down, that founding businesses is down, that general liveliness is declining because the population is becoming increasingly aged. I don't know that anyone's done this very well. I certainly don't know of any attempts to do it uh, on the academic side. But to my mind, it is a very important factor. You can judge the results by looking at the standard inputs and then seeing how they come out of Japan. They come out quite uh, not nearly as well. So that's one structural issue with, for Japan. And I, in my mind, that's probably the most profound. Now, without having to make judgments on Japanese approach to immigration, naturalization, all of the things that, say, here in the United States, we take to, we take for granted as very much part of the way we do business, uh, the way we conduct our, our our culture, basically. That Japan has, without making any judgments, Japan does not permit a great deal of immigration, and as a antidote for declining population that seems to have no attraction whatsoever. So that is a possibility as far as alleviating this problem. And it's the road Japan is not taking. So we have that one structural issue, we have population. We also have a, a one way, another way to stimulate economic growth is stimulate competition. That also has limited application in Japan. Again, I, I can't talk too conclusively about how much this affects Japan. But many aspects of Japanese, the Japanese economy are quite heavily regulated and quite heavily protected. Some of these have having to do with farmers and rice growing are viewed as cultural assets. Well, that's undoubtedly true. But it's also true that the more you regulate an economy, the less it performs. Now, there is a trade-off, of course, that is a necessary trade-off. Nobody says that modern economies can exist without regulation. I would certainly not say that. But there is a trade-off. And it does seem that in Japan, perhaps, again, due to the aging of the population, that there is less electoral pressure. Matter of fact, there's the reverse. Instead of pressure to reform, there's pressure not to do anything. 
And so it's very difficult. Remember the three arrows of Abe's plan to revive the Japanese economy. Uh, get the yen lower. Well, that certainly hasn't worked very well. Financial stimulation, they've been doing that for 20 years. I'm waiting for the results. The last is economic reform, and that's essentially never been tried. And because of the re relatively protected and regulated um, condition of the Japanese economy, there hasn't been a lot of creative destruction, shall we say, the Mysian term, from the outside. Comparison in the United States. Um, the American automobile industry dominated until the 70s. Uh, I don't know, probably 80, 90 percent of the cars sold in the United States were made in the United States from the, uh, in those days, there was more than three big uh, car companies. But the United States cars, our United States market is relatively open as far as the world goes. And what happened? Well, I think about half the United States automobile market is now. foreign car companies. Many of them made here in the United States. Nevertheless, they are foreign car companies. That was probably more than anything else the source of both angst and you might say agony for Detroit and also of revitalization. In order to stay in business and meet that competition, the American car companies had to change and change drastically. And they did. And they lost a lot of market share doing so. But they did. There was a time where there were serious quality differences between, say, Toyota and GM, or Toyota and Ford, or Mitsubishi and whatever comparisons you like to make. I don't think there really are anymore, but there were. And had that been a protected market, they probably would have remained. So all of these things are factors within the Japanese story, within the within Mr. Kuroda's dilemma. So there are inherent, I think, aspects of this which probably exacerbate the situation in Japan. So let's turn to the purely economic side of it. Okay, this is, um, I think I showed you that chart, so I'll do it again. Now let's take a look at another example. This is U.S. debt to GDP. Now this is total public debt. I believe, although I couldn't get the, the spice, precise definition, this is um, both uh, all levels of government in the United States. And you know exactly what happened here, okay? 2008, everything goes higher. So there isn't a lot of information in this chart just by itself. And this is, in fact, you might say the mirror image. It's not quite, but it's sort of. Why are debts rising? I mean, look at the coincidence is perfect here. Why are all these federal debts rising in the United States? Um, well, because interest rates are no longer functional. Because interest rates, as a supposedly spur to the economy don't work. Sorry, but they don't. And the proof of it is right here. The Fed could no longer guide markets lower because what happened? The commercial markets began to ignore the signals coming out of the Fed when it comes to their interest rates. 
the 30 year rate didn't come down, stood the 30 year mortgage rate to prop up the housing market. Uh, it didn't start coming down until the Fed started their QE program to drive it down by buying asset backs and forcing the rate lower. Okay, so let's look here. We just did that, sorry. Now ah, that one's not, not what we want. Let's go to this one right here. Okay, this one I prefer. Uh, this is a Japanese GDP in, in white. Uh, the overnight call rate in orange and the dollar yen in green. The one thing I think that's interesting about this chart <clears throat> is really the lack of correlation on the chart. After all, the purpose of the two policy decisions, interest rates and the dollar yen rate, are they simply because central bankers like to do things? No, at least they're a sensible policy decision. Their ostensible purpose is to promote and spur economic growth. And you have to say, looking at these charts post 2009, I fail to see any correlation in what's going on here. Certainly any sustained correlation. You could make an argument that this period right here, from 2014 on, as the yen rockets up, but there's quite a serious delay, this is 2000, late 2015 already, that this small rise in uh, Japanese GDP is related to this large rise in the dollar yen rate. And I think there probably is some correlation there. But as far as cause and effect, as far as efficiency, there's almost none. The yen went from below 80 to 125. And the Japanese economy barely touched 2% for one quarter and then came off again. So if this is the result that you're looking for, perhaps you should look somewhere else. So on the Keynesian side of this, on the policy side of it, we are still looking for the tool that Central bankers, Haruko Kuroda, can use to move their economy. Does that mean that the tool exists and we haven't found it? Or that perhaps it is beyond the limit of what central bankers can actually accomplish? We always tend mankind to give more credit, more potential credit, and more blame to our leaders than is warranted. In the United States, lately, certainly since the Second World War, we seem to think that the election of a new president will solve or can potentially solve all problems if only of course, depending on our, our political beliefs, that leader is allowed to act in everyone's best interest. It's not true, it's not even remotely true. Presidents, kings, <clears throat> prime ministers, whatever you'd like, are far more constrained by their circumstances than we believe. 
And one of the reasons why they appear to have so much more effect, or as they wish, is because that's how they get elected. You don't get elected by saying, you know, I'm not going to be able to do very much, but vote for me and I'll not do very much, but things may get a little bit better. And no one ever won an election with that kind of campaign. So the necessity, of course, is to overpromise and then necessarily underdeliver. But I think this is true not only of political leaders, I think it's true of authority figures in general, and certainly the central bankers are authority figures of the highest order, in that many people believe, or at least hope, or feel, yeah, it is just like working for a living. That's the truth. <laughs> that is definitely true. You got to remember, you know, uh, Janet Yellen sitting on that FOMC committee committee is no, and I'm not picking on Janet Yellen, is no Athena. She is not there, this fountain of wisdom that can order the world to her liking. And in fact, the example I'm using, the Greek gods couldn't do it either. They would order things and people would go off and do what they wanted to anyway. So central bankers and policy is far, far, far more restrained let's put, than we imagine. Let's put it another way. Why do central bankers cut rates all the time? By whatever means. Remember quantitative easing. They're all just interest rate policy by another means. Why do they do this? Because it's the only thing they can do. For a while, I remember Ms. Yellen was talking about this macro prudential policy. What a bunch of pardon me hogwash. Macro prudential. What does she mean? Well, we're going to design regulations that will prevent these things from happening or bad things from happening. Almost exclusively, when have regulations ever prevented the gyrations of an economy? They don't. They are almost exclusively after the fact. What they do have the ability to do, which we've seen, is deaden economic growth. If you lower the amplitude of a, an economy's variation, it seems that you lower it on both sides. You lower the excitation side and you lower the depressive side. You moderate. But then what do you get? You get eight years of 2% or less growth, using the United States as an example. What do you get in Japan? You get 20 years of one or one and a half percent growth, which somehow seems not to be acceptable. So remember this when you hear what you're going to start hearing the next, everybody's about to go on vacation here. By the way, this is my last webinar for several, more than three weeks, I'm, uh, I'm going on my vacation. So everybody's gone. Uh, wherever the French go from Paris, they go. The United, people from New York, the financial communities will go out to the east end of Long Island. Uh, London, I don't know where they go. If anybody's British there, they can tell me. I suppose they go to Mallorca or something. I'm not really sure where they go. Where they go to Ibiza, something like that, the, uh, the Mediterranean coast of Spain. Anyway, wherever they go, for the next three weeks, everybody's going to be on vacation. So the financial news flow is liable to be at limited. So what are you going to hear? And what you should do is do your best to ignore it. Don't tune in any news station for the next three weeks. But they're, yes, it is. I agree with you. But they are going to be talking about how the Fed September meeting is live. They're going to be talking, probably once again, give them a week or two, about how Japan needs to do something and they're probably going to stimulate the economy with more spending. You know why Japan didn't do it? Because they're running out of ability to do so. There are no more JGBs to buy. The Bank of Japan is already buying 100% of the debt issued by the Treasury of Japan. There's no more debt to buy. 
So what can the, Jap the Japanese government do? Well, perversely, for a government that's over 200% indebted, as far as the GDP goes, they can issue more debt. Has it worked in the past? The answer is clearly no. So you're going to hear these things the next couple of weeks. Do your best to concentrate on the beach or wherever it is you are. Because for all of them, they are slate of hand, sleight of hand from central bankers who have run out of things to do. Even if the FOMC raised rates in September, which I do not think they will. How do you raise rates on an economy growing 1%? Oh yeah, I know, the Atlanta GDP is now, the Atlanta Fed GDP is now 3.8%. As I recall, the estimates for the second quarter also started north of 3%. And they ended up at 1.8%, which was 50% higher than the actual at 1.2%. And that will probably go up a little bit. So the idea, I, for my mind, of the Fed raising rates on an economy that has yet to perform more than 1% over three quarters is nonsense. And of course, there's also the U.S. election. I fail to see how the Fed will get up its nerve to raise rates two months before an election. I just don't believe it. So we'll see if it happens. Um, to my mind, this is a total smokescreen from the, uh, from the FOMC who want everyone to think that they're in control of things. They're examining the data dependent uh, to, um, oh, that's an interesting question, an interesting way to look at it. Um, I'll, 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 let me entertain that in a second. Um, so both for Japan and the United States, policy options have run out essentially. The only thing they can do in the United States is probably raise rates. Now, if the, if the, if the FOMC put rates up to one and a half, they shocked everybody and did it somehow, I don't know, God knows what would have happened. What would you get? Well, you'd get a recession, but what would you get after that? You'd probably get a, a semi return to normal growth. So let's look at Japan. Let's look at the post with, um, someone has posed on the chat, which I think is a very interesting way of looking at it. What would a university economics professor do about Japan? If you didn't have, take it as a blank slate. We know that interest rate and fiscal policy haven't done anything in Japan. I could be a little more profane than that, but I will not. We have the evidence in the chart sitting in front of us. So we know it doesn't work if we're willing to acknowledge it. Now, it's, it's of course clear that central banks and governments around the world are incapable of surrendering their aura of omniscience, especially on the central bankers' side. They seem to enjoy it. Maybe they think it's a halo. It ennobles them beyond the general run of the population beyond politicians, certainly, because the only thing that central bankers are thinking about are the good of the economy. Well, it's a halo, which is extremely transparent. It ennobles nothing. In fact, it deludes from what's actually going on. Now, as I said before, central bankers are enjoined to act, both by their own philosophy and by the exaggerated omniscience, I don't know if omniscience can be exaggerated, probably not, by the exaggerated faith we have in their abilities. So they are bureaucratically disposed to do something. The fact is now they don't know what they do, what to do. So, and what, what actually would work would be painful in the short run and they'll never do it. So let's take a look. As a thought expert, briefly here, we'll end on this. What would a university professor prescribe? What might work? Take Japan, for instance. Now, 
how limited the question you of course have to say is how limited are the prescriptions meaning if you are only operating this theoretical university professor in japan if you're only operating with the brief of the existing setup meaning and i'm not even talking about political possibilities just within the central bank schools or the central bank role given the current tools that exist in japan what could mr kuroda do and the answer seems to be that there isn't anything Mr. Kuroda can do. And this is an extremely unsatisfactory answer for Mr. Kuroda's boss, Mr. Abe, for the vast majority of journalists and others for whom we get much of our, many of our opinions and our knowledge from, that this is unacceptable. There must be something that the Bank of Japan can do. There must be something that the Ministry of Finance can do to change the situation. And if there is, in fact, nothing that they can do, then what should they do? Well, they shouldn't do anything because it seems clear that the actions that they are taking are not helping and they are storing up a load of trouble. How do I mean that? Well, why do central bankers have such a obsession about 2% interest rates? I mentioned this before. Is there any, now I'm not an academic, as you know. I'm a former central, I'm a former uh, currency trader um, for 15 years in the interbank market. Although I do have a, a master's degree in international finance and economics, but it's a 25 years ago. Why is it that central bankers have such an obsession with restoring 2% inflation? The answer to my mind is quite simple. It's because they serve governments whose debt ratios have exploded. And there are two things you can do with debt that at some point you can't pay. You default or you inflate. Inflation, price inflation has largely been, if you look at price charts, Going back to say the 16th and the 17th century, you can do this in Japan on rice. You can do it in England on corn. Inflation is largely a invention of central bank policy. Now, you have to put that in context, of course, because when you look at central bank policy, you also talk about the industrial revolution. And I am not prepared today to try and go into the relationship between modern banking, or at least modern finance, and the Industrial Revolution. Because if there's one thing that's certainly true about the Industrial Revolution, whatever else you want to say about its issues, is that it has immeasurably improved life for most people on planet Earth. Okay, folks, I have run over a little bit. Um, I hope this rather wide-ranging uh, discussion was useful. If I take anything from it, please take a degree of skepticism about what you read, about what people in authority say, about what central bankers say, about what they can do and what they will do. Again, I will type in my email address. If anyone has any comments or criticisms, please 
It took me a... <laughs> uh, the purpose of all of this is to help people, in my mind, not just make better trading decisions, but to judge uh, some of the other aspects of their life. After all, if central banks were to succeed in restoring inflation, that would matter to us. And if growth, economic growth, is not going to be much above here in the United States, 2%, that matters to us all. Um, so try to take these things into consideration. It's very difficult. Anyway, thank you all very much for attending. As always, I take it as a great compliment that people take time out of their day to listen to me. I hope you all have a very lovely end of the summer. And as they say in that old song, see you in September.